I'm really excited about this session. Um, this is our final session of the day of day two of our supply chain transparency conference. Um, we saved the best for last here. Um, one of our most exciting conversations around um, the evolution of EU due diligence. Um, so I am joined here um, by John um, Notterdame, of, uh, the senior advisor and co-founder of CSR Europe. Um, I'm also joined with Georgia McCauley, uh, project manager for EU affairs at CSR Europe. Um, then I'm also joined uh, with Veni Simijuska, a partner at law firm Fox Rothschild. Um, she specializes in exports. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm joined here with Amanda Levitt, a partner at Sandler, Travis, and Rosenberg, specializing in imports. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Good evening. And good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Very nice. happy to have you all. And for those of you who um, are just dialing in, my name is Marissa. I am SourceMap's Director of Policy. Um, our discussion today is really revolving around um, the evolution of EU due diligence. Um, you know, as has continued across the theme of this two-day um, event, um, the uh, uh, policy changes um, governing global supply chains are, are changing rapidly, they're changing fast, um, and updates came out just recently from the EU um, regarding uh, their proposal around forced labor, as well as deforestation, circular economy, really the list goes on and on. There's quite a lot of um, upcoming reporting that will likely be required for um, global supply chains. And so that's why we've, we've brought in this, this really um, exciting team of, uh, of experts with very different uh, experience in very different areas uh, to talk us through some of those updates. Um, so let's kick things off. Um, some major updates have taken place over the last week. Um, including updates around the EU's deforestation regulations and the EU's forced labor proposal. Um, in a few words, um, what impact do you see these reg regulations having on the market? Um, Georgia, let's start with you. Thank you, and uh, yeah, thanks for uh, for having us, and uh, uh, good uh, good afternoon, everyone. So yeah, on, on the on the question uh, on the question itself. So as you as you said, basically, and you also mentioned it before, what we are experiencing in Europe right now is really what we call an avalanche of uh, of regulations, legislations in general. Um, so all of, all of these, and uh, uh, we do see that this amount of uh, policies are impacting the market market uh, generally, but they are an expression of something that's changing pretty much in the way policies are made and sustainability at large is tackled. Um, when it comes to the ones that you mentioned, and specifically the latest one that is, is indeed really welcomed, I think, um, the forced labor proposal, that's putting really black and white in, in a regulatory fra format framework, what actually the uh, ILO has already put in principles um, years ago. So this proposal really sets in place, in place actually controls to products entering or leaving the market. And we, we see that, of course, this creates a limitation to trade. Um, and the proposal itself, the labor one, but also the deforestation one, we, as the commission says in the text, creates a level playing field for Europe. Um, and it really removes what has been seen in Europe as an, unf an unfair competition, um, specifically based on the lower prices of this, the products that uh, are produced relying on deforestation and uh, forced, uh, forced labor. So as part of this bigger, uh, bigger picture, what we see is that really decision makers are changing the way they produce policies. They are not anymore what they used to be at the end of the uh, of the century, but they are really left. Uh, but they are really changing uh, the market. So they are not letting anymore the market to regulate itself and um, to regulate businesses. But they are the ones regulating businesses. And so it's a new way of working, and it's also a way to lead by example. I would say Europe has this in. This is something that Europe wants to do. I lead, lead by examples to probably also push other realities, and they don't mention, we don't mention to do the same in in the future, in the future uh, months and years uh, to come uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, Georgia. That was a really great overview of what is um, a, a, quite a complex set of, uh, of proposals. Um, you know, we've talked a lot over the, uh, the course of um, this conference about the UFLPA as well, 
as sort of the um, the first building block in what seems like a, a movement towards stricter laws governing um, uh, supply chains, particularly when we're talking about forced labor due diligence. Um, as we know, that law went into effect on June 21st, so we're only a few months in. But Amanda, I'd love to uh, pose this question to you. Has the UFLPA set a standard for forced labor due diligence what key similarities or differences, um, uh, and we'll open this up to the room as well, but what, what key similarities and differences are you seeing between the UFLPA and what's come out over the last week um, from the EU in their forced labor proposal? Sure. So the strategy guidance did set forth in writing a due diligence checklist, if you will, by the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force. And so they noted you know, you need to engage with suppliers directly and map out supply chains to identify the risks that you may have and vulnerabilities in your supply chain. Make sure you have a written code of conduct and train across the supply chain on that code of conduct and your policies. And while you are monitoring compliance and taking on the appropriate and credible audits, make sure you are identifying any violations that need to be remediated and making sure you have a corrective action plan to remediate those violations. And the, the due diligence is on a larger scale to combat forced labor. And so the similarities that we're seeing in our interpretation of this proposed regulation is to know your suppliers assess the risk and have that visibility in your supply chain. Um, but the key differences are that EU is not focused on China. It is forced labor anywhere that this, these regulations and guidelines are going to address. And so the, the standard is less of this import ban focused on a region, but rather widespread um, due diligence measures that you need to take as an economic operator. And another key difference is that for the EU legislation, the competent authorities will bear the burden of proof to establish that a product has been made with forced labor. Whereas under the UFLPA, once an importer's goods are detained for any suspicion of falling within the scope of the UFLPA, it's the importer that needs to prove a negative in order to get the goods released. And if there is a violation of the EU forced labor ban, the products of concern cannot be made available on the EU market, and they also cannot be exported out of the EU. They have to be disposed of by the economic operator. But under the UFLPA, if you receive a detention notice or an exclusion notice, you still have the opportunity to re-export those goods to a market that will accept those goods. And so that opportunity allows you to salvage that cargo. And also the economic operator needs to withdraw the products already made available on the EU market. But a very big difference through how the UFLPA is being enforced is the UFLPA is really focused on the border crossing of that import. And so CBP does have authority to request redelivery within 30 days after release of those goods from CBP custody. But after that time frame, an importer isn't required to remove those goods from the shelves. They can continue to sell them in the US market. So those are the key differences in my opinion between the two different regulations or laws. Thank you for walking us, uh, us through that, Amanda. You, you talked a little bit about that difference in who holds the burden of proof between the UFLPA and um, the EU proposal for forced labor. Let's drill down on that a little bit more. Um, Veni, I'd love to, to uh, kick things over to you and ask, um, you know, what are some of the U.S. best practices that the EU can learn from um, in elaborating their forced labor proposal? As we know, there's a, a very long process um, uh, uh, to actually um, enact these proposals that were just um, set forth by the EU. So we have quite a bit of a runway left. Um, what, what would you say are some of those, those best practices that they could take from the U.S. policy? 
Sure. Um, I mean, the EU proposal is broader in geographic scope than the current US law. Um, and it also applies internally to products made within the EU. But um, I think one great feature of the EUFLPA is that, as Amanda mentioned, it identifies targeted industries and is going to publish an entity list of bad actors. So this way, importers and buyers really will have a baseline of information as to red flags. And I mean, this is somewhat similar to sanctions, which the US has, the EU has, particularly with everything going on now, it's very helpful, um, especially for smaller companies, startups, um, to be able to look at a list, look at particular industries and know that you know these might pose red flags. Does this mean that all other industries are safe? No, of course not. You know, you have to do your due diligence no matter what, but at least this provides and creates a little bit of guidelines in your in terms of your due diligence process. I also think on the US side, assigning a specific tax task force to monitor the developments and issuing guidance is also really helpful. Uh, the US obviously has the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, and, which is which maintains the entity list. But um, you know, having a governmental body that's tasked with following uh, the rules and getting a little bit more in the uh, you know in the in the weeds with it, so that they can provide ongoing guidance is I think really important, and that's. Also similar to, you know, in the US we have CFIUS in um, the EU, that there's been a number of different foreign direct investment rules. And it's, again, it's a bit similar to that. The risks change, you know, as geopolitics change. And these days that happens very quickly. So it's, uh, it's really good to have a body that's tasked with really tailoring the rules and providing guidance as, as it comes. And what would you say, um, continuing on that point, um, from a legal standpoint, what are some of those existing loopholes and weaknesses um, in, in the U.S. policy as it stands? You know, yesterday in our session assessing the UFLPA, one of the questions that we got from the audience to um, John Foote was, you know, is the UFLPA working as intended, which is, you know, somewhat of a loaded question. Um, but from your perspective, uh, what, what would you say some of those, those loopholes um, currently are and, and maybe speculating on how the, the, EU, um, uh, the EU's proposal, while we recognize that they're, they're different in scope, um, uh, uh, where, how they might be able to learn from the, the loopholes that exist in the, um, in the US policy? You know, I think that one of the key weaknesses, and it's not just the US policy, but partly, you know, the, the UFLPA is that we really need the cooperation of all of our allied countries in order for this to actually work and to have the desired impact of actually rooting out forced labor. Um, I mean, as an example, under the UFLPA, if a product originates in the Uyghur region of China or is produced by an entity on the list, then the importer has the option to attempt to rebut the presumption, as Amanda said. But the desired impact will not be felt if the importer can find a new buyer in Canada and ship the merchandise there. So we, again, and I'm, I'm sorry to continue to reference sanctions, but it's just, we've seen this work really well with after the, the uh, conflict in Ukraine, the world, the, the Western world came together and came up with uh, very similar types of rules and sanctions and enforcement, and that really helped. So I, I think at the end of the day, we all have to work together in order to try to make this as uniform as possible. Um, but in terms of the EU's diligence proposal, um, I think, you know, just a couple things. One is that providing as clear of a procedure as possible um, is really important for enforcement purposes and um, making, making it as targeted as possible, you know, so, so we could make enforcement just a bit less challenging. That's great. Thank you for that, Benny. Um, uh, kicking things back to Amanda here, um, traceability and visibility in supply chains are, um, you know, two very common terms used in the context of forced labor. We've heard that, you know, again, over and over again, um, even just across the sessions today. 
Um, but they're both presented as part of the solution. So um, the, the question I have for you is, how can poor supply chain visibility exacerbate forced labor risk? Right. If, if you don't map out all your tiers and you don't know all the suppliers in your supply chain, then there is a risk that an entity you don't know is involved in the manufacture of your goods aren't being audited properly or may have forced labor vulnerabilities in their policy. And without full traceability of the chain of custody of the materials as they make their way through your goods and the sales that lead up to that finished product, it's possible that a nominal material supplier or somebody in the earlier tiers is tainted with forced labor allegations or some type of import restriction unbeknownst to you. And without being able to have that visibility, you won't be able to assess the forced labor risk at all the tiers. And because there is no de minimis exception, it does open you up to considerable risk at the stages where you don't have visibility and you haven't vetted those suppliers. That's great. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, Georgia and, and Jan as well, um, due diligence policies, you know, we've talked a bit about this. They're, they're popping up all around the world. You know, we're obviously talking about the EU heavily here in this session. Um, but given the large number of existing and future legislation in this area, how can companies navigate organizing their due diligence and ESG strategies? I mean, understandably, you know, global brands um, don't just have to be worried about one policy, they're really affected by all of them. Um, and so that can mean a lot of reporting requirements, a lot for them to figure out, a lot of ambiguity in this period where maybe they don't know yet, or we don't know yet what the official requirements will be under some of these newly proposed laws. Um, should they prioritize a specific legislation? Georgia, we'll start with you here. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, basically, you, you said it all. So what's happening again is there's uh, really a huge number of uh, policies that m many of them, as you said, are still proposals. So you can already navigate them, but at the same time, there is still much to do and to, to have a clear understanding of what will be the final, the final, final text. So generally, and then we can go to, do, to your second question, but generally what we say is that when companies are there in dealing and addressing all these policies and legislation, they are possibly asked now more than ever to shift their strategy and their mindset as companies. So not only from short-termism to long-termism, but also from this silos approach that companies do have right now when dealing with sustainability to a more comprehensive and enlarged uh, approach. So really understanding and uh, uh, taking into consideration indeed how these policies are really interconnected one with each other. And this is pretty much the approach that we have in Cesar Europe in offering tools and support to companies to uh, uh, allow them to uh, develop this comprehensive uh, indeed uh, methodology. So companies should really uh, start creating these interconnections, uh, both first in understanding, but also when it comes to then uh, dealing with the different departments. So different departments should really build up these cross-functional task forces maybe to then tackle the um, different uh, um, topics together and also understanding the sustainability should be a bit streamlined uh, all over the, the company. And just to complement on the last thing you said, so, and, and maybe Jan can also said something more after, but should the company prioritize one specific legislation? In our view, kind of the CSRD together with the standards are uh, uh, this uh, um, first element to take into consideration because really the standards do touch on every on every possible uh, uh, side of sustainability. So also the due diligence per se is part of the standards. There is a standard completely on workers in the value chain and already reading that standard, you can understand the direction that the commission has taken, that the EU has taken. So not prioritized, but taking into consideration that the CSRD is really a tool uh, for companies to understand where they can go also beyond compliance maybe. That's great. Um, thank, thank you so much. And, and Jan, anything to add on that? 
Well, uh, I understand your question. Eh? For the moment, if you look at the map of Europe, it's a bit patchwork. There's a lot of atomized effective regulations and proposed regulations. And that is why a European regulation to create one playing field and to tell companies, look, there, there is one framework, but you still have to wait for two or three years, the time they vote, and then it has to be transposed in national law. And then of course, the European system is that you have one framework and then on certain elements, governments have a kind of march of maneuver to add or to um, extend a little bit the scope or, or some of the criteria. But I would say for 90%, there is a European framework on due diligence to be respected by companies. And what Georgia just said, I think is very important. The problem will become more about, uh, for companies, how to um, manage uh, what today are atomized EU proposals on due diligence with a piece in the uh, proposal for um, corporate transparency that is including, of course, also due diligence. And that will also be complemented by a European reporting standards where Europe is going to define far more how to comply with this directive on transparency. And then companies are also having an eye on what is being under construction in the so-called climate environment and possible future also social taxonomy, which is through the investors, another pressure on companies. Um, so that is the real challenge. And that is why uh, it, it, it was named by Georgia. And there is a kind of perception that there is a kind of avalanche coming on business, not that much the national ones, but the European ones that you will have to bring together in an integrated approach um, and, and to make sure that inside your companies, you have different teams and departments working together, not to have a, a, a headache at the end, because if you take them in isolation, you will get a headache. Totally agree with that. And, and, and building off of that, Jan, um, you know, we've heard rumblings of certain industries and certain sectors you know, being identified as more at risk than others for, you know, human rights uh, risk or environmental risk. Um, with some of these proposals, does this mean that some sectors that have maybe flown under the radar so far don't have to worry about supply chain due diligence? Well, on, on one side, you're right. There are sectors that have more impact and that are more at risk. Is it garment, footwear, agriculture, minerals? We know them all. Uh, and they know very well themselves. Uh, so no, nobody can hide himself anymore because the, the European regulation on due diligence will, will hit all sectors. They will fall all under the scope of this directive. So um, they, they will need to take their due diligence processes very seriously. And we also know that sectors depend on other sectors. There's also that, that cross sector element, which is very important. We see that a lot with the automotive and all the related sectors. Um, and of course, one is making pressure on the other one. There's a kind of cascading effect. Um, so nobody can really say, oh, I'm falling under the radar. That, that's, I think, over. Also because what we mentioned you have the other directive on transparency that are also coming after you and asking for much more quality information on the way you manage, for instance, uh, sustainable supply chains. And you, you really have to give uh, very detailed quality information on that. So no, all sectors are under the scope. Thank you for that. Um, and you know, discussions on introducing these new due diligence rules um, across the EU have also proposed uh, introducing uh, public lists detailing bad practices of countries or companies. This is very similar to what we've seen from the UFLPA with the entities lists um, uh, uh, coming out of US Customs and Border Protection. Um, Veni, do you believe that such approaches will help move forward um, the fight against forced labor? Are there negatives to to publicly publishing those lists no i think they absolutely 
will. Uh, but the the challenge is to Jan's point is that if the U the U.S. each country in the EU has a different set of lists, then it becomes very difficult, particularly for some of the larger companies that do cross border deals and you know various different industries. So it's it all comes back to again unifying the various standards unifying the list to the extent that we can between the US among the EU and among the US and the EU in order to uh, really make enforcement easier um, and it's um, I think it's really the, the only way that we'll get there and it's good this has happened with the foreign direct investments you know countries have different, uh, regimes and different things that they focus on. And then you, a couple of years down the line, first of all, you realize it's very difficult to enforce. It's very difficult to um, actually comply. So you're, you're forced to come up with something that works for everybody. I think we'll see that in the future, hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, the, the list of um, uh, potential supply chain uh, um, uh, disruptions and, and potential uh, uh, risks to a, a global supply chain is just uh, uh, increasing more and more. And some of that, frankly, uh, is tied to um, escalating global conflict. Um, so shifting gears a little bit to talk about how that kind of plays into supply chain due diligence. Um, you know, how might a, a large scale conflict such as the war in Ukraine, I mean, we've been seeing Quite a bit of news alerts coming out just today and yesterday um, uh, about um, uh, the the conflict ongoing there. You know how might conflicts such as those factor into existing due diligence policy um, and potentially supply chain disruptions? Um, Georgia, I'll I'll hand this one to you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Marisa. And um, so, of course, I think that we all experienced it as consumers. First of all. Um, how much what what's happening in Ukraine, the aggression uh, from Russia to Ukraine has been uh, uh, reflecting in the prices of what we consume. And so that's just a consequence of the disruption in the supply uh, sorry supply chain that uh, has been has been happening. Generally, I think that um, it's quite clear how much indeed the uh, the uh, how much indeed the the conflict itself has been uh, reflecting um, on uh, on on uh, on the on the supply chain and on raw materials, uh, but I would say that if anything, a war like the one that we are seeing can only reinforce the debate around the need uh, for a better, I mean, better choices in the policy making. So when it comes uh, to Europe specifically, now we see that this discussion around also the idea of becoming more independent and autonomous on raw materials is really at the center of the debate. So maybe also it can reinforce the debate when it comes to the policy, but then when it comes also to the due diligence, I think that, yeah, more than ever, it underlines the uh, risks that human rights have when it comes to um, when it comes to war related, of course, to supply chain. And we don't have to go back in time to, I don't know, to the, the two world war, World War II, that of course had this kind of situations, but in the more recent um, also conflicts beyond the Ukrainian one, we, we can see actually that uh, uh, military action was strictly linked to uh, civils, to the, to the civilians being forced to uh, labor, uh, forced labor practices. So uh, generally, we, what we can see is that the EU is working hard on pushing for an autonomy, and I would say that this is a consequence on on this. And we saw the speech that uh, Ursula von der Leyen gave, and um, given sorry at the uh, speech on the state uh, of the union, clearly also. Uh, announcing this critical raw material act that's all pushing for that uh, pretty much then we see how human rights are at the center uh, of the debate and now probably this will impact the processes from a legislation point of view that will be made around the due diligence proposal and also like trying to set standards to uh, possibly avoid um, also supporting indirectly practices uh, that worse, like the one that's going on right now in Europe, clearly make clear that can happen. And I think since COVID as well, how much supply chains need to become more resilient is clear and possibly we are moving towards that. Absolutely. And you hit the nail on the head um, that 
I, I believe that the onset of the COVID pandemic really um, uh, illuminated how fragile so many um, global supply chains are. You know, we even saw just from a logistics standpoint, the stranding of the ever given, um, which now feels as if it was years ago, but wasn't that long ago, how much of a disruption that caused across global supply chains, um, you know, really uh, uh, um, hammers home kind of the interconnectedness of um, uh, of our global supply chains. So let, let's circle back to um, the uh, um, uh, EU regulations themselves. Uh, you know, we heard a little bit from uh, um, the American Apparel and Footwear Association and Retail Industry Leaders Association in our last panel discussion on navigating forced labor laws earlier today that, uh, you know, many brands have pushed back on the timing requirements surrounding the EU um, proposals, um, you know, from what we've seen, the time between when the uh, um, uh, laws would go into effect and when the enforcement guidance would be released, um, it, that is a very short window. Um, and brands have expressed that, you know, it's, it's from their perspective, a nearly impossible window. Um, you know, some have uh, uh, said that this, you know, it sets uh, brands up to fail to not comply with um, with these regulations. And similar criticisms have been levied against the UFLPA in, you know, the the fact that the enforcement guidance came out very shortly before the June twenty first deadline. Amanda, what would what are your thoughts on this um, in, in terms of uh, you know uh, the broader question of are these laws um, achieving their intended effect of, you know, lessening forced labor risk in supply chains or lessening environmental, um, environmental risk in supply chains, or, you know, really setting brands up to, uh, to not be able to comply given, given the requirements. Yeah, I think it'll depend on how strict the guidelines are and how broad the due diligence requirement is defined by the commission but companies will have 24 months to set up a system or policies to combat forced labor. And from there, companies will have six months to tweak or refine the policies that they had set up based on the guidelines and the concrete detail in those guidelines. So for companies that are getting their ducks in a row now, I, I would hope that they won't be completely off, caught off guard by the guidance issued. Um, because to your point, the US government's Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force had offered very little in advance of implementing the US, UFLPA. And you know we were working within days of a timeline. And so I had clients who felt very unprepared uh, within you know, the months leading up to the UFLPA's effective date. And the worry really surrounded what surprises would be in that guidance because many companies, rightfully so, were worried that their suppliers would be listed on the named entity list um, or just that their policies weren't enough based on the guidance that was issued. But we did the best we can leading up to the operate um, operative guidance being issued and the strategy guidance being issued and just having the high level objective in mind of combating forced labor and having these policies worked out beforehand in a way that's manageable for your company was able to then be compared to what was in the strategy guidance when it came out. So I had set up calls with companies where we, we sat down and we compared the guidance to what we had already prepared for them. And what I found during this process was companies were pleasantly surprised with how prepared they were based off of, you know, setting up the right visibility and paper trail and policy and codes in place so that they can address forced labor generally so that then when, when the guidance came out, it was in line with what US government had in mind for companies. 
Thank you. Um, and uh, circling back to Jan, um, you know, due diligence legislation uh, is seen as relatively new on the EU agenda. You know, as we mentioned, these proposals were just released in the last, I guess it's about two weeks now, um, or a little under two weeks. Um, even the member states uh, have not been active in legislating this area um, of company law with, you know, several uh, um, countries, France and Germany specifically, um, uh, with, you know, these are current countries that have uh, due diligence laws currently in effect. Um, the German law is one that I will say a lot of brands are, are tracking very closely because it is expected to be um, fairly strict. But how have companies been preparing for this upcoming wave of, of obligations and potential reporting requirements? Well, you say it's relatively new. I would not agree with that. Um, I remember already in 2002, the European multi-state called a forum on CSR, including enterprises, industry sectors, trade unions, employer federations, the green NGOs, the social NGOs, and you name it, and all the experts around already in 2002, we're having very regular debates at European level already on due diligence, on human rights. Um, CSI Europe was engaged together with BSR, Business for Social Responsibility in the United States, and having common um, ateliers and, and, and learning um, labs with companies where we had buyers and their suppliers next uh, each side by side in a kind of uh, co-learning mood about how to handle all of this. So there has been already over the years uh, preparation, of course, with the most proactive ones, for sure. And it's true that you have big gaps in each sector between champions and laggards. But now with the regulation, the, the, the effect is that you will see this gap narrowing between the champions and the laggards. Now, having said that, um, we have seen also some industry sectors being more proactive than others in the textile sector, cacao sector. And this is a proposal that we are making to Europe since now um, many, many months, already two or three years. We started with the European German presidency, that's two years ago, and, and making proposals uh, to the EU for a more integrated policy on due diligence, with on the one side a regulation to create one playing field, also requested by companies, more and more, and industry sectors. But on the other side, we also clearly said that regulation is not what is going to create the most impact. It will increase compliance, it will increase uh, auditing, it will be very much handled by legal affairs and companies, having a clean sheet. But the real impact on, because what is the real purpose? It's all about how do we contribute in enhancing the livelihoods of thousands, if not millions of farmers, miners, workers in all these supply chains, next door in your community up to on the other side of the globe. So that is where we are asking to the EU policymakers next to a regulation that should not become a tick, another tick the box. We ask for far more accompanying measures. And there are two that we are uh, highlighting a lot. One is have European industry sector alliances on due diligence. So you have the industry sector together with a number of experts and stakeholders. You bring more intelligence around the table. Was it only to develop more specific sector guidelines on due diligence? Is it also to build a stronger quality data that you can mutualize and that is not there for only the happy few that can afford good analysis and data, but you share it with all members of the sector? Or is it as a sector to provide facilitation for collaborative solutions? 
between companies of the same sector or to shape cross-sector solutions in the regions uh, that are of higher risk or more in need. And the second accompanying measure that we want to privilege is where is it that locally the EU authorities do support what we call local ecosystem partnerships, where you put dust on your shoes and you ask companies to engage in building or co-building solutions to create value locally so that children or women in mines do not see mines as the only job to earn some coins. So uh, that is what we are advocating a lot for and a smart regulation and a very strong uh, battery of uh, accompanying measures. Sorry, I was too long. I was oh too long. no, that was perfect. I was I was just about to say strong words and, and we appreciate that. Um, and you, you really noted the difference between you know, the regulation text itself and the actual impact. And that is really a, a, a critical point, not just for the EU proposals, but something that policy analysts have been furiously writing about in the last uh, few months about the UFLPA, you know, is the, the actual impact aligning with what the original intent was and what the law stipulates. So that, that remains to be seen as we, you know, are only a few months out from the UFLPA going into effect. Um, a follow-up to that question um, would be, you know, what do you see as uh, an organic next step, organic next steps um, for um, the EU sustainable finance um, and due diligence agenda? Do you see it as expanding the scope of the legislation to cover, for example, a, a larger number of companies or sectors? Or um, do you feel the next step should be more substantial, for example, um, expansion of actual material obligations of companies or further exploration of uh, the concept of personal liability for environmental or human rights damages. I know that's a, a multi-tiered question. I'd love to, to pose that uh, back to you, Jan, and also to, to Veni as well. Well, you speak already about a next step when there is still fire in the parliament in terms of negotiations, and you can easily imagine we are in the final sprint of negotiations, so um, it's tough. And well, let's trust that uh, the many years of building intelligence and consensus um, is going to lead to um, a smart, balanced, mature first regulation, which in any case will already in the next three years after it will become effective, be reviewed, and then certainly um, calibrated here and there. You see it with the French law on the voie de vigilance. If you look at the review of that regulation after two years, the report was saying, well, yeah, we can improve here and there the regulation, but what is missing most is this accompanying measures again. So that is where, uh, when you mention what are next steps, that is where we would like to put the focus on next steps and not to keep open, 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 uh, I would say, uh, the whole discussions about scope and, and, and things like that. Because you have then also to give room to the judge and to the courts. Case law is the elephant coming into the room. And um, we, we have also to trust that they will start to play their role, also with regard to interpretation. Uh, so that is what you have to give time to, for that. Um, you don't have a permanent negotiation for a regulation. Uh, I think it's not healthy. You have to give time to execute, to implement, to see what, where are the gaps, what can be improved, and then what is case law telling us uh, with regard to the implementation of these new regulations. And then let, let's see about what is it that we do um, through industry sectors. They have to take up their responsibility for 40 years they have been extremely conservative on sustainability issues. And they have to shift their role as pure lobby organizations into, they have to, come, to become capacity builders for the thousands of their members. There are 27 million enterprises in Europe. Of course, very small and medium, but they all will feel the impact of the regulations. It will, it will trickle down, it will cascade further down. So 
that is where um, we expect also sectors to play their role. And for the moment, it's not that obvious. Huh? They feel the heat, but they still um, lay back a little bit too much in our opinion. And um, yeah, that is what we see as, as, as the most important next step. And, and, and just to finish here, um, there has been a lot of energy spent over the last two, three, four years, and I would say even more. This regulation is only the tip of the iceberg. I can tell you, uh, be before this commission, European Commission, there were two European commissions before that uh, with a big fight internally inside the administration to go for a regulation with then some resistance at the, at the very top, huh? not making it a priority, fine. COVID has changed that completely. So, um, so what we say, all this energy that has been put into regulation on what we call the duty of care, we have to add what we call the duty to collaborate. And this has to do with credibility of politics and of continent. If you do not invest in, in and support uh, companies and industries in a kind of duty to collaborate, because that is where you will have the most impact. Even big, big minds, uh, we, we speak a lot in Cesar about the, lonely, the loneliness of big minds. When you go locally in certain provinces in, the, in Congo or other places, they are very isolated from a kind of collaborative partnership move mood to address solutions together with competitors. That needs to change. Otherwise, don't believe that more audits papers will give impact. And if, yeah, you, I... if you speak, if you go with your feet on the ground with also the NGOs, if you get into the mines or in the farms, farmers tell you, thank you, Europe. Thank you for your beautiful values and principles and regulations. It didn't change anything to my life except that my daughter is not helping me anymore in the farm and I have to pay for a logo, fair, fair trade logo. I have to pay for it. Thank you, Europe. That is what they say. So we have to stop that. Benny, anything to add uh, there? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll take the kind of the, the more practical in terms of what can companies do right now to, or what could they have that's already existing in place that they could do in order to comply. Um, on the US side, I mean, we've, we've all talked about the fact that uh, the regulations and diligence uh, suggestions need to be more uniform across the Western world in order for this to work. But just on the US side, CBP and the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force issued guidance generally in due diligence, but in it, they refer to a Department of Labor publication called Comply Chain that lays out and how an importer may demonstrate due diligence. Um, there are obviously very different ways to do that, but they do lay out some ways which are helpful, I think, and can be helpful to companies. And it's um, more general practices like engaging the stakeholders and the partners, um, assessing the risk of the imports, uh, and the developing a code of conduct, training your supply chain. So speaking with your direct and indirect suppliers to the extent possible to educate them on what the requirements are and monitoring compliance. Um, of course, companies need to drill down on that. But um, I think the difficulty comes in with the fact that modern supply chains are often large and complex. So it's very difficult, to, especially after conflicts in Ukraine and COVID, throw all of that in. Um, so it's it's very difficult to map out suppliers. And um, I think that's where the great new technology for supply chain mapping like source map make a big difference because this is really the type of tech and service that actually makes it possible to monitor global supply chains on the large scale that is needed this day and age. Um, one other thing that I think is popping up uh, is on the US side at least um, using forensic science, DNA traceability, isotopic testing to establish the origin of products. Um, that's been deemed to be an acceptable form of evidence under the UFLPA. Uh, so for example, apparently I didn't know this, but isotopes in cotton um, are unique 
to each specific type of cotton so you can use that to figure out where the garments are coming from. And the US government is going to be relying on this science so companies um, can and should as well. Um, and finally, I would say, you know, don't undermine your contracts. Uh, companies should certainly look at their contracts with suppliers in light of forced labor legislation. And a well-written supplier contract can be a really important tool in ensuring compliance. You know, um, so being able to access, if you have to rebut the presumption of forced labor under the UFLPA, um, an importer would need to submit a massive amount of documents to trace the merchandise and we need to have the ability to get the documentation from its suppliers. So that needs to be in your supply contracts. And we always work with our clients to assure that because that, that can be really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, uh, both, both you and Jan, great, um, uh, great comprehensive answers there. Um, let's uh, pull things back. This is uh, related somewhat to one of the, the questions that we've gotten from our audience members, just about kind of precedent. And, uh, you know, Jan, you mentioned this a little bit, that um, there are laws already on the books. There are conversations that have been had, uh, um, you know, and it, it's been many years for some of these. And what we're, uh, what a, a major question from brands and importers is really kind of what takes precedent. So um, Georgia, uh, from your perspective, how important are, for example, let's talk about the international standards, the OECD guidelines, UNGPs, um, how important are those international standards in the evolution of due diligence laws? How do they factor in, you know, not just in the EU, but beyond, um, and how big of a role have they played or do we expect them to continue to play in setting the stage for mandatory requirements? Um, in the form of uh, these laws that that will, will go into effect in the coming years? Yeah, so for sure, what we can say is that uh, these are internationally recognized standards and framework that have been helped companies also to find their way so far and still do when it comes to due diligence practices to put in place to human rights, um, to human rights, uh, um, uh, the, the, the um, possibility to defend human rights in the supply chain, sorry. But what is also important to, to highlight is that many of these uh, international standards, so from the OECD guidelines to the UNGP, the ILO, they have really set um, for real what uh, um, the concept of, for example, human rights due diligence is, uh, then also enlarging it to an environmental and, govern and governance topic as well. So, of course, they are and they play a big role in how then policies are structured because they really set the basis on which everything else has been in a way or another then produced. Um, so this applies also beyond the EU. But if we want to go uh, a bit more into the EU thing, because of course it's something that we are looking at really closely every day, it's uh, clearly stated in the text of the proposal that the Commission uh, has taken the UNGPs and uh, the, the, the ILO text, the OECD, as the basis on which they built the CSDD. Uh, we see indeed, as is, again, the concepts have been taken from the OECD guidelines, for example, that also have been used as a basis to build, you know, the six steps of approach that are also in a way into the proposal of the due diligence at the European at the European level. Um, also the idea of the sectorial approach and this I the idea this idea of I uh, risk um, sectors um, as well, even if there are differences like the not not taking into consideration the financial sector, uh, for example. But something that I also wanted maybe to put uh, the light on is that for how much uh, the EU has tried to use these standards as a basis to build its, its proposal. Um, there are some ideas that actually the, 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 there are um, differences and probably uh, things that the EU could have done better in order to have this harmonization between the things. And something comes from the UN precisely that reacting to the proposal of the EU is saying that there are areas of improvements that hopefully will be improved, like this idea 
of established business relationship that there is in the proposal that actually is something that goes a bit against uh, you know the the the, the UN uh, text as well or even the idea or better how human rights impact are uh, disciplined in the uh, proposal it's really a bit far from the UN text and this can the list can actually go on so for how much there has been a, the possibility of taking these things into consideration the international standards into consideration there has also been something else done to go a bit far from them possibly because of course there were many interest and perspectives to take it into into consideration we will see what will happen in the in the discussions in the parliament we expect them to be quite intense because of of a really strong uh, position in the parliament that is a bit more uh progressive if we can say so on this um so yeah we, we will see i personally think that the eu did its best for what the eu is it's not a state to be uh as I mean, as an harmonization tool as possible, but of course, again, it's not a state, many interests are there. And so, yeah, I think still much could have been done and NGOs in Brussels know that I think very, very well. Absolutely. And, and on that note of uh, harmonization, um, I, I know we're coming up on time here, but I'd love to talk a little bit about the potential or the role of collaboration um, in uh, uh, what we're seeing uh, across the EU. So, you know, in, in implementing these due diligence measures, particularly um, uh, the forced labor proposals, um, you know, the discussions are focusing on introducing these new obligations for companies, um, again, at, at both the US level and the EU level, um, but the data required um, and the interlinked uh, nature of international trade really raises some questions about, um, you know, how productive would it be or how helpful would it be to introduce uh, a level of collaboration here? Um, do you think it's necessary to introduce mechanisms for dialogue and cooperation between economic actors to promote best practices? Um, Jan, I'll, I'll turn this one over to you. Yes, I think at least the EU has um, has a strong role to play, and they have to take the responsibility. Especially Commissioner Breton, who is in charge of industry and grow, um, he is the one that is focusing a lot uh, on what they are calling this ecosystems. Um, is it driven by one? sector or is it multiple sectors but that is um, a strong stake for Europe uh, to take in the past the EU uh, the European Commission has been having a number of pilots to support industry sectors to build uh, sustainability CSR and due diligence strategies for the whole sector the European sector and then it became global with all kinds of enrichment. So I think that is a positive sign um, uh, that was at least in the past, how much are they going to invest uh, in that? That's the big question. Um, some governments like the Dutch government has also a culture of what they call um, convenanten. It's this kind of partnerships on due diligence where you put all players to look for where is it that they can uh, improve more from a bottom-up perspective than only a top-down perspective. And it's very interesting what you see coming out from there. Um, so that we hope is, is what is going to lead the, the, the future debate on due diligence. Um, and then we, we have to be also very realistic. Even the biggest brands today, uh, even if they would fully and well comply with the new regulations, setting all the processes in order, the impact still will be quite limited if they act alone. And we see that in uh, an initiative which is called Drive, Drive Sustainability. It's the 11 biggest automotives uh, in the world that are now since seven, eight years working together uh, with the facilitation of CISA Europe. And there you see, and when you listen to them now, is it the Volvos or the Daimlers or the Volkswagens and others or the Toyotas, they say what we can reach together is far more than what each of us would do even very well. So 
setting standards is not only a top down something, it's also very much a bottom up something. Uh, is it how you collaborate to bring the best content for training, not a couple of dozens of supplies, but hundreds of supplies, but you do it together? Where do you build local or national um, capacity building networks to continue all the work for embedding human rights, climate and environment into the supply chains. So you have to build the capacities also locally. So that is joint ventures and investments that are happening between companies of the same sector. And then we start to see with maturity in each of these sectors, a capacity to start to think cross sector initiatives on due diligence. So that is what we call a full bottom up standardization uh, that is of the responsibility of the companies and their sectors. Thank you for that. I, I know we're, uh, we're we're coming up on uh, on time here, but I'd love to leave us um, on a, a hopeful note or a note um, looking to the future. Uh, I'd like to go around the room for, for each of you and just uh, you know in a minute or less, you know what do you see as kind of the next step? What's next on the agenda? Either as a recommendation for companies that are hoping to, you know, proactively implement supply chain due diligence, you know, what would you see as a, a critical first step, um, you know, for for brands and importers that are maybe, you know, in panic mode right now about everything that they're uh, they're going to have to juggle in the next few months. Um, Amanda, I'll start with you. Or in terms of the next steps, I think the first step can be a baby step. It could be a simple step of just creating a file of all your tier one suppliers and then asking your tier one suppliers to ask who their tier two suppliers are and just manage it by having a long-term solution that works for your company and and will be, you know, won't be cost prohibitive. It will allocate resources at the right cadence and know that forced labor compliance is not going anywhere. Sustainability is also, you know, moving in that same trajectory of, of you need to have policies in place. And so start now by figuring out what is your company's identity and long-term plan to achieve your goals. Great, Benny, I'll uh, uh, ask you the same question. Yeah, we, I mean, we work with our clients in order to do just that, map out the supply chain to the extent possible. Again, using companies like SourceMap is hugely helpful in that, but it's also working with our clients to engage the stakeholders and their partners, you know, the, the individuals, the entities, the communities that are affected by the operation, the key suppliers and working together to assess the risk and develop a code of conduct and really educate um, all of those groups within your operation. I think that's really important. Great. Um, Jan and Georgia, I'll kick the same question to both of you. Georgia. Okay, yeah, I'll go first. That would be really, really, really quick. I think that, yeah, I would be a bit more ambitious probably because of course of the role that I have like outside of a company, but I would expect probably as a next step, really what I said before. So all these policies, due diligence, like to really push companies a bit beyond their comfort zone. Um, I know that's uh, that takes a lot, of, a lot of work, but possibly also keeping in mind, and this is, maybe the big next step, like it's it's coming, like consumers are really dictating how things are done because more and more they are becoming aware and sensitive to these things. So I think that for companies at the end of the day, this is the direction also because those that demand are asking for it. So really in the long term, I think this would be this would be the case. I think Jan, yeah, you can. Oh, <laughs> it has been a lot about the regulation and how to how to organize it also internally and, and I would add put dust on your shoes meaning go through the value chain and see where locally um, your company as a buyer might also take responsibility to forge this local ecosystem uh, partnerships to bring change in the livelihoods 
Otherwise, it's becoming a, a big administrative something. Put dust on your shoes and engage in local ground corporations. That's great. I, you left us with a great soundbite there uh, to close things out. Um, I know we went a little bit over, but I wanted to just uh, extend a, a, a huge thank you to our panelists, Jan, Georgia, Venny, Amanda. Um, really excellent discussion today. It was, it was such a pleasure to have uh, your wealth of experience um, on this panel uh, to close out the Supply Chain Transparency Conference. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Take care.